ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming today. For the one who doesn't know me, the one who don't know me, uh, I'm Max, I'm the president of the World Communications Forum Association. Uh, and uh, I have the pleasure to officially open one of our uh, master classes, uh, which we organize every single month since a couple of months. And we will continue, of course, with the master classes. And usually we invite great experts to share their experience because more or less it's unique. Uh, it's unique initiative. Majority of the master classes, especially with the top level experts, they're either paid or they're not uh, internationally known and distributed like we do and our executive assistant, Jessica Kristeva, is with me also and she's supporting us of the presentation of the master classes. We selected a couple of very important uh, and very hot topics concerning the public communications globally now. And to be honest, everything which you will hear from the local experience of our experts, it's very easy to implement globally, I would say. <coughs> the, 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 the border, between global and local in the modern public relations business is very invisible. I acknowledge that each country has its own characteristics or traditions or histories or culture or perspective or development of market or whatever. But at the end of the day, uh, a lot of the international ideas might be implemented locally. So today we invited our good friend, Amanda Kolemar. She is a really great expert. She comes from the United Kingdom. Uh, they celebrated the coronation of the new king. Uh, they uh, overcome their hangover after the celebrations. And now Amanda is with us, uh, fresh and ready to highlight uh, how to overcome a communications crisis. She wrote an excellent book a couple of months ago, dedicated on the crisis in the communications. And today, this is the absolutely most important element of our communications job, because crisis we experience every single day. In the past, oof, crisis we had once in a month, and it was a huge event in a public relations company that we didn't sleep, you know, and we were, uh, we were, we were having stress a month before and a month after, but today it happens all, almost every day. So Amanda will highlight the importance of having a plan, the uh, importance of uh, developing the strategies for business and some organizations, the role of social media, the impact of crisis communications uh, in the brand reputation and all those details. She will speak about 40 minutes, 45 minutes or whatever she prefers. And then you'll have an open area, open space for questions. And I'm sure that you'll receive your proper and very professional answers. I thank you very much for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, Amanda Coleman. Oh, thank you for that, Maxim. Um, it's really, really good to be here. And um, and absolutely agree. The world has shrunk in a lot of a lot of ways. So I'm hoping that the things that I go through today will um, be as relevant wherever you are. Um, certainly, some elements of it I would hope would resonate as well. Um, so yeah, so I, I my background was um, within uh, policing. I started with my working life as a journalist, and then moved into PR and ended up doing police communication. So quite glad that I left that three years ago. If you've um, anybody seen any coverage of um, the the criticisms of the Metropolitan Police um, around the uh, coronation, so um, the biggest thing I think in terms of my learning, uh, which I, I took forward in writing the books, but also in what I do, um, was uh, I was the head of communications in Manchester when the arena. Uh, Ariana Grande concert attack happened in 2017. It's coming up for six years and a few weeks, and um, and it feels just like it was yesterday in terms of uh, of what happened. So the learning from that, I think, for me, is is one of the critical elements. Um, um, and Maxim just teed it up really nicely in that 
we are in a world that's in chaos. And I'm old enough to remember a time when things seemed a lot more steady. Um, you know, it, we weren't in this kind of perpetual state of, of uh, flux. Lots of things have happened. Obviously, we've got um, the pandemic and even the kind of aftermath of that um, is still affecting as well as climate change, financial. If you look at it, there's huge amount of, um, of uncertainty that we're all living with. And I think this, that for me is something that is really different and will change how we approach things because people's threshold for dealing with things that happen um i think is getting is getting um uh, kind of higher you know there's a lot more uh points at which people are just overloaded very very quickly so if you're dealing with an, a brand or an organization and you have something that happens we have to remember the kind of mindset that people are going to be in when we're, we're going to try and do the communication so yeah, but lige bare lige, uh, hear om du had... two things to that that often get talked about now um that you'll hear polycrisis and perma crisis i'm not an, an academic by any stretch um but it's it's an interesting kind of way of summing up where we are um so going back some years polycrisis was what was talked about which is when there's a cluster of situations that are interlinked and interwoven um, interwoven crises that then kind of compound and make the situation worse. And that's kind of developed with where we are now, which is the word of the year when the, certainly um, added to the dictionaries in the UK last year was perma crisis, um, which is this extended period of instability and insecurity. And at some point, it's almost like something that doesn't seem to have an end. And I'm, and I don't know about how everybody feels, but certainly it's felt like that over this last uh, sort of three or four years that this we're in a continued state of um, of crisis uh, and trying to manage these situations. So, what does that mean in terms of where what we do and how we operate and how we deal with crisis and how we communicate? Well, we still need to get the basics right. So, things like preparing planning, having a having something ready to go when things happen, being able to move really quickly. And I'll talk a bit about um, the speed with which uh, we need to operate now. Um, having that structure and framework. So very boringly for me, but, you know, it is about having those roles and responsibilities, things that people can understand that, that you know, you, the roles that people will do in trying to um, address what need, what's happening, whether that's in you know employee communications internal, whether that's stakeholders, um, customers, or whether that's dealing with the media and social media, and understanding and planning for social media, I think is really critical. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that um, because of all the factors that it brings now: the fake news, the um, expert, self-appointed experts, um, and and how that kind of plays into what we do. I also think it's important that when we start to look at crisis communication, we don't forget all the things that we do on a day to day basis. And it's really easy for us to kind of get in that crisis mindset and we forget to, you know, re remember what are the values that are behind our organisation? What is it that's important to us in terms of how we communicate? So we've really got to keep connection to, to those elements when we look at how we're going to deal with, with whatever happens. And ultimately, and this is a real challenge, I think, in terms of um, spokespeople and in terms of brands, is being authentic, is not trying to become something else when that crisis happens, but keep those that kind of core values. For me, when we underpin all this, it's about trust and confidence, and we want to try and maintain, build, and and have that trust and confidence to help get through that crisis. And if you start behaving in a different way than you than you people are used to you uh, operating, then it starts to cause kind of a concern. So, what happens now? You know, so that's all the basics that we still need to to have, and that's important. There are a lot of what you can see as are the challenges or opportunities, depending on how you, you, you want to look at it. Um, fake news, I'm going to go talk through these um, in a minute. Um, fake news, uh, self-appointed experts, and that I think you see, we're seeing a lot more of that appearing um, when there's a gap in what's being said, when people don't understand what authorities are saying or what brands or organisations are saying then they go somewhere else kind of links with the rise of influencers as well in terms of uh in terms of pr 
Um, levels of trust, and I think genu generally, go back to what I was just saying about that chaos and people's um, difficulties, day-to-day -day challenges, financial challenges, um, levels of trust within authorities, uh, within brands, um, is, is very variable at the moment. Um, can nobody can can do any kind of PR talk? I don't think about anything without mentioning artificial intelligence, um, as that seems to be uh, a kind of the topic of the day. But I do think that it brings with it challenges and it brings with it opportunities. Um, but definitely within that crisis space, it, it's it's really there, and I'll mention that. And then always, always is the speed with which we operate, and um, that for me is, I think why do we do all the planning? Why do we need to do the preparation? It's so that you can get in that space quickly. And we'll talk about that as well. So tackling fake news, um, it's really challenging. Two elements to it, really, misinformation and disinformation. The only difference there is the intention. Um, I've dealt a lot with misinformation, people just not understanding quite what the situation is. Um, and so they spread information that's incorrect. Um, there are a few occasions um, where I've had to deal with disinformation um, and that's even that's the most challenging when people are deliberately trying to undermine what you do uh, by spreading false information. And it's one of the most difficult challenges. Um, again, for me, if you've got a crisis communications plan um, that exists, if it doesn't include um, and a section about how you're going to tackle fake news, then I don't think it's it's suitable for for operation in the day you know in the world we're living in at the minute. Things we need to do is spot it, spot it soon, spot it quickly. Have the media monitoring in place and that, the social media monitoring so that you can spot these things really quickly, and report it to the relevant um, social media network. I know that brings very little back now. Um, I think, you know, some years ago, you could get a lot more uh, action from from various kind of social media providers. That doesn't happen now. But I think reporting it is still a really important element to do. Definitely, if you decide that you need to take further action as well. Um, checking the facts, you know, we've got to make sure that we're making, providing absolutely the right information. So keep check, checking those facts, keep making sure that what you're putting out is 100% accurate at that point in time, and build to become that trusted voice. All these elements will knit together, but you've got to be um, in that space to be given the honest information, uh, to keep that flow of information, um, and keep reinforcing the truth and keep saying, even if it's saying the same thing over and over again in slightly different ways. Um, and encouraging that challenge um, as well, not necessarily from yourself, uh, but from your networks, from your stakeholders, from the people who are there um, as kind of brand ambassadors. Um, they can step in that space as well and kind of help to deal with that. But it's not easy. And if that wasn't hard enough, um, we've got a position now where we're trying to um, deal with what are called sort of self-appointed experts, people who, um, again, either for, for genuinely good intent or for bad intent, set themselves up as experts to fill in the gaps um, that they see um, exist within um, a crisis uh, communication. And there's a lot more of this happening. We saw it in Ohio with the train derailment in February. Um, and again, the reason the experts kind of pitched up then, experts, um, was because they, people couldn't understand the information that they were being given. Um, they were being told about the toxic waste spill and, and how many parts per million in water and in the soil. People don't understand that. So how do we address these things? Because it's only going to get worse, I think, um, as, as this certainly next year or two goes on. Again, it goes back to building trust, building trust in what you're saying about the situation that you are dealing with and being open and honest about what you know at different points in time um, as that crisis develops. But it's also important to know what matters to people so that we're not just telling people what we want to tell them, but we actually understand what really matters to them in this situation and what's happened and using that really simple and clear language and being really uh, understanding those local contexts. Again, if you're working globally, um, it's about having people on the ground that you, you can give you that really local context um, and that will make sure that your language is simple, clear and understandable for the people in that area. 
Um, we can't expect that people are going to find us. We've got to find them um, and we've got to go where people are to communicate. Um, I think, you know, we, their expectation historically has been we'll put information out and people will find it and find us. Actually, we need to be in that space. We need to know where they are. And that's why I say all the things you do on a day to day basis, understanding audiences, understanding kind of diverse communities and um, whatever that, you know, those things are all um, really essential to a really good, um, effective kind of crisis communication response. And then the thing that I seem to be saying a lot at the minute uh, to people I'm working with is speaking first and speaking frequently. So it's about getting in that space really quickly and making sure that you own it and keep reinforcing things, keep saying things. And I do think that's why the creative side of PR, often people think it, it, we leave it at the door when you're dealing with crisis. I don't think you do. I think you've got to use those elements of creativity to make sure that you can find different ways to say the same thing, that you can show the visual aspects of what's happening um, and that you can keep reinventing what you need to do as that crisis develops. So reputationally, I think there's a, a, a huge challenge um, now. Often what we've dealt with are kind of what I would call operational type of crisis. Something goes wrong, something happens, um, you know, there's some natural disaster. What well, actually we're seeing a huge, I've seen a huge increase um, in uh, people both wanting to understand and kind of to train staff on is reputational crisis. And they seem to be massive biggest sort of pressure um, because it puts your organisational culture, your organisational operation in the spotlight. Um, it could be because of behaviour of employees. It could be because of something that's happened in terms of how you operate. It could be just the relationships that you have with other organisations and with other um, uh, businesses. So I think we've got to start making sure that all the systems and processes that we've got in place for all those crises, cyber attack, whatever it might be, will work for us when we deal with these reputational issues as well. And I think they, they absolutely will. We've got a massive situation in terms of reputational crisis in the UK at the minute with um, what is the, the Confederation of British Industries, which is a, a kind of a group, uh, a body to represent businesses. Um, it's got a huge number of um, paid members um, and has gone through, a well, is going through a huge uh, challenge now. Um, there have been a number of complaints um, about behaviour. Um, it's led to a police investigation that's ongoing at the moment. And there is a big question now, given that they've lost their one chief exec, they've got somebody else come in. Um, they're saying it's in the papers today that they're going to kind of build a cup from the ground. Um, the question is whether they can survive because the pressure on the organisation has been so much, uh, has been so intense. And they've got this, you know, potential um, outcome of the police investigation um, that you can really not sure how how they're likely to survive. Um, and this similar thing you're seeing with the Metropolitan Police. There's been a huge amount of, of kind of similar internal kind of cultural um, uh, challenges. And even yesterday with one of the political parties uh, that, that, that work in, in Wales, um, they, again, there's a report came out about behaviour and, and what's happening there. So I think we've got to look at these things, look at what's happening in these organisations and make sure that we would be prepared. What does our business look like and what would we need to do if something like that happened? So in terms of reputational crisis, I think that the, the, the approach is to recognise that there is a problem um, and that issue or that problem exists. Um, again, we see a lot of problems with um, certainly the CBI, which I was just talking about, kept trying to kind of push, uh, push the situation um, out of the spotlight. Um, had they recognised it early on, they perhaps could have got control a lot quicker. Um, You've got to try and do that and then be proactive and take the lead and show that you are changing. You are going to deal with whatever the situation is um, if there is a need to change. Um, obviously, we always talk in crisis about stealing thunder, which is basically getting your information out first. Um, and if you've got to apologise and you've got to say, you know, yes, this this shouldn't have happened. This should have, should have happened in a different way. You say that so that nobody's going to have to say that to you. Um, and again, for the reputational elements, I think the more you, you can do that, the more you're going to be able to take a control of the situation um, and lead what's happening and not be um, kind of 
put in, in, under that intense pressure. We're also going to look at continuing that honesty and transparency. It becomes really challenging when you're dealing with senior leaders and their leadership and the way they run the organisation is the thing that's under under pressure and under criticism. But again, for me, communications PR, we have a unique role in to be able to do that and to, and to really be that um, voice um, that is the truth of, of what the situation is and how things look to people outside of the organisation. You've got to look at maximising the support. Um, use again. I think you know we underuse in crisis response our networks. You know our relationships, other organisations that can come out and support us, that can say something. Um, that sort of third party endorsement. Um, and I think again with reputation elements, if you say we we're good and we've dealt with X, Y, and Z, that's one thing. But if other people are saying it about you, if other recognised you know kind of organisations are saying that. It's, it means so much more. We've got to make this reputational management um, um, really at the heart of daily business. We've got to understand it. We've got to be able to recognise it, move quickly, see these problems um, at the early stages so that we can get, get you know, kind of get on top of them um, as soon as we possibly can. And this is an area I think that we've got to keep learning and developing and particularly training those people who are at the top of organisations in terms of how to approach it, what they need to say, how they need to respond um, and what should be happening. So artificial intelligence, um, I'm not an expert on it by any stretch, um, but I do use it because it brings lots of opportunities. Um, definitely, you know, I use it in the crisis simulation um, space because it, it brings all kinds of uh, text and um, images that you can use. Um, but I think as we see from here and, you know, we're only starting to see the, the sort of scratch the surface of what it might be able to do. Definitely in terms of that data management and then that disaster response, um, I think we could see in future that there will be more opportunities for it. Um, but obviously what we need to do is have that guidance, have that kind of um, identified any issues um, that, that we have with operating it and make sure that we're using it in an ethical and a kind of appropriate way. Um, but I, I kind of have in my head that there will be a point in time where we can use artificial intelligence to find our problems before they emerge so we can really get ahead of them. Um, but yeah, and, and, we'll, and I'm, we'll see how that develops. So I'll, I'll show you the, these um, different images and um, just real or not, um, I'll let you kind of have a have a look and think, are they all um, real? Are they none of them real? Um, or are some of them and others not? In reality, so I'll let you, you pick, pick and choose now, but the reality is they are all fake. They have all been created by artificial intelligence. And some of them in, look incredibly realistic. And I think for me, this is where you get to the issue of that's a massive opportunity on one level, but it also brings with it huge risks, the risk of fake photographs, the risks of, you know, the, that being circulated. Um, it's gone way beyond just the words that used to happen. And going back to um, when I was responding to the arena terrorist attack, I got a phone call to say that it was happening. Um, that they'd well, it had been an explosion. I did my usual thing of going onto social media and putting the TV news on. Um, and on social media, within 20 minutes, 25 minutes of uh, happening, there was already a fake photograph circulating. It wasn't, well, it was a real photograph from a training exercise, but it obviously wasn't from, uh, from what happened. And that was six years ago, coming up for six years ago. And it was already a problem then. So you can see how the speed and the problem with misinformation and fake photographs is only going to get worse. It's only going to get more of a challenge for us. And again, it's about making sure that we've got systems and processes um, that will and plans that will help us get through this. Just some brief things there. You know, as I say, I've mentioned it before, using AI um, before gathering data and insights, helping you to review plans. I also think there's a, there's a real help for when you have that moment of um, stress when that crisis happens and your brain, your mind goes blank and you don't know what is it I should be saying, then this is for me when artificial intelligence can come in because you can use it as a kind of sounding board to give you a starting point 
that you can then adapt um, as you need to because you know the situation, you know your organisations and the organisations you support better than anybody else. So I would never just do a straight cut and paste, but um, I also think, you know, it can help you in that space of I'm just having a bit of a stress because I'm not sure what happens. Um, I do think we also keep an eye on the, the ability to get software that will identify those fake photographs uh, because I'm sure that, that that will arrive if it's not already arriving um, to help us find navigate that way, um, the way through those fake images as well. But I also think, again, we can we can start to look at it to look at trends and insight um, and help us to develop those next steps. So I see it as an opportunity. I see it as something that we need to be uh, aware of and looking at how we can integrate into what we do in terms of crisis response. But ultimately, the speed, oh, some years ago, I mean, go when, back in sort of the... Um, late 1990s when I first went working in police communication you had loads of time if something had happened you know you knew you probably had a, a, an hour or two hours possibly a bit more to get some information together to check the accuracy of it and to get that information out realistically now you have 20 minutes um that is it from the moment an incident happens to you getting your first line in the sand your first statement out to show that you're aware that something's happening and that is a massive challenge, again, because, you know, you're at the risk of, I don't know a lot of information at this point, but I actually need to say something really quickly. Um, and, it, and I was just doing some work on a, on the newsletter I do, um, and there's a, an article about um, food regulators, um, the, the international food regulators were, were meeting, um, I think, in Scotland um, recently. And that was one of the issues that they brought up, the, the challenge of the need to speak really quickly, but also knowing that you're going to have some big gaps in the information you've got. So this, for me, again, underpins why it's so important to have planned and prepared, to look at pre-prepared statements. What are the what can I say to show that I'm aware of something, but actually isn't going to cause me a problem as this develops? Um, and that kind of messaging, I think, is something that we absolutely need to talk through. We need to have prepared. We need to have a starting point that will allow us to operate with speed. The other challenge is obviously that kind of governance arrangements and having a, some kind of delegated authority so that the communication team can operate without lots of barriers of approvals. Again, really challenging that for, for uh, senior leaders to give that control. Um, and that, for me, is why we need to do all the preparation work so that they're comfortable, they can see what we're going to do, um, and that they give us that kind of ability to operate without having to seek approval. Um, we, I certainly couldn't have done what I've done over the years if that wasn't the case, uh, because you can't, you've got to, again, speak quick, speak first, speak quickly, and you're not going to be able to do that if you have to get two, three, four different people um, to agree a few lines um, or a few, a few pieces of, of information. So, additionally, again, look back at the PERMA crisis situation, we've got a lot of crises that are potentially long running. Um, definitely in that reputational space, if you get caught up with a reputational crisis, the, the possibility is that it's going to keep reappearing, almost like a roller coaster where it comes and then it goes away for a bit, but it, and it comes back because of something else. So how do we approach this? Because, again, historically, we've been used to, you know, crisis emerge, go on for perhaps a, a day, two days, a week, a couple of weeks. You don't get things until COVID, until the pandemic happens. You don't get crisis that last um, for years. Um, again, things to think about, maintaining a fresh approach, um, being creative. We're going back to that creative space um, that we, we, we inhabit as PR professionals. Ma maintaining that fresh approach, finding different ways to do things, being creative, really then working to engage with people. Um, I think there's still a big frustration I have that we do a lot of putting messages out when something happens, but we don't do a lot of listening within a lot of businesses and brands and organisations. And if we're going to be in that kind of uh, a long running situation, we've got to listen. We've got to understand what people are, are concerned about. We've got to kind of engage with them uh, and use that to build strong communication. We also need to keep reviewing the focus and making sure it's in the right place, because if a situation is going to develop over a long period of time, then the focus and people's concerns and what's happening may shift and probably will shift. So you need to be able to be flexible enough to adapt and develop in relation to that. 
and to keep reality checking that the way you think things are are actually the way they are whether that's how the response is developing or whether that's how people feel about what's going on another huge challenge um, which i talk a lot about with people is their own resilience and business resilience uh, because if you have a situation that goes on for any length of time it really zaps your strength um, and your you know your ability to kind of keep bouncing back from the problems so again it's about building uh, systems and processes that will allow people to have time off that will give people um, a bit of, of downtime that will allow you to look at how you can build that kind of resilience uh, around what you do. Um, we also need to look at trigger points, points in time where this is going to be increased, where there's going to be a further problem. Thinking about that case study with the CBI, they've definitely got a situation where there's going to be a number of kind of key points in the future. They've got to build and prepare for them. Um, and that's the key thing for me with long running crisis is to keep building for that future point. So I'm conscious of time and I want to give time for questions. Um, in terms of other kind of case studies of what, what works well and what doesn't, um, you know, going back to uh, Jacinda Ardern, uh, former prime minister in New Zealand, I think a lot of people talk about her kind of leadership style and how she dealt with a number of things. With the terror attack in 2019, some really important kind of um, points which are now being reinforced by um, international national kind of guidance things like not mentioning the name of the attacker um, really focusing on the support to the families of, of victims um, sure I mean all this is, is kind of things now that are seen as um, good practice in in that sort of uh, response um, but also things like taking action action on on, gun, uh, on guns which which was talked about and if you looked at it in any detail, which I haven't got kind of a time to go into, if you look at it, real focus on attention to detail on the fact that little things really do matter when you're in that crisis response. I always say we plan for the big things, you know, plan for, for the how we're going to approach it with the systems, the, the statements, the messaging, so that you've got time to make sure you don't miss those small things um, that will make the big difference. Um, the same with the COVID response in the early days as well, um, when her communication style was very clear and it was focused on bringing people together um, and also was really authentic. You know, there was Facebook lives from home and, and those sorts of things, which I think made a big difference in terms of how people interacted and kind of with with, um, with what they were being told and about lockdowns. Obviously, that changed as things developed. But in those early stages, um, you could see the, the the benefits of that. Like, there's a kind of going back a, a few years now, 2015. This was one where I think um, this was about how you kind of really do um, get ahead of things and and take responsibility. It was a um, theme park in the UK, Alton Towers, um, where there was an accident on a ride and it left people injured and and some people sadly, um, unfortunately, lost lost limbs um, in that. But from the moment that kind of happened and from the moment they started having to talk about it, they took with total responsibility. And I'm sure there would have been a big uh, discussion with the legal department because I'm sure they wouldn't have wanted that to happen. But the chief exec went out very quickly on to, um, to deal with the media interest and took responsibility and kept focusing on the people that were affected um, and obviously recognised that they were going to take a short term hit on reputation, on, on the operation of the business, but that that would give them um, a longer, you know, they would recover quicker if they could do that. And when they were doing that, and there's a really classic interview, which I use for media training a lot, where the chief executive has been interviewed on Sky um, News and um, and it's brutal. Um, it's a brutal attack on him. But given that he's already admitted responsibility, he's already talked about what they're going to do to try to, to support um, kind of those who are affected. The, the interview has really got nowhere else to go. So actually, once that, that kind of grilling that he'd had for nearly 20 minutes um, went out, the complaints from people watching were about the interviewer's approach, not about the interviewee. So um, again, you know, the importance of being really open to say, yeah, we know we're going to have to take responsibility for this. Let's do it early um, and let's take that control. And, you know, um, I think for me that that was a, a really good example. So some top tips to kind of to take away, hopefully, um, from this. The first thing for me is to make crisis risk management part of your day-to-day -day business. Um, 
it's you know it's something we've all got to live with it's something we need to be prepared for and if we're doing it right we can spot things at an early opportunity to get in there quickly and to be in that space um, at the earliest opportunity we've got to keep building reputation and trust in the good times for when these problems occur and i think we sometimes crisis communication work can feel really disconnected from everything that that pr and comms teams are doing but actually they are so they're like two heart two two sides of the same coin um you build the reputation in, in trusting good times so that it's there for you to call upon when you need it when things have are not have not gone the way you need them to definitely look at planning for fake news planning for those so-called experts and how you'll respond to them and what you need to do and make sure that you're ready to move really quickly remember that sort of 20 minutes realistically 20 minutes from something emerging happening uh, being being covered in the media or whatever 20 minutes for you to to then get in that space speaking first and speaking often um, and making sure that you're reinforcing um, what you need to say about what's happened be creative to get that engagement that we talked about um, and keep connecting with people and keep connecting with with what's and with you know explaining what's happened and also have a go with the new technology. Don't be frightened of it. Look at what it gives you. Um, keep up to date with how this artificial intelligence kind of developments are going to come uh, thick and fast probably in the next sort of few months and, and years. Um, because I do think as well as having to be prepared for the problems it's going to bring us, there will be opportunities to help you as well. And always one of the most important things for me is make sure that you're still focusing on the people people who are affected people's views people's attitudes how do they feel about things and make sure that you responded to that and not just saying things that you um want to say about what's happened so there's a few couple of if you're interested in in looking at the kind of human aspects of um of dealing with uh disasters emergencies this might seem a bit distant from some people you can call oh, i don't deal with that kind of disaster management but actually in terms of how people respond to a crisis and how people feel about a crisis there's a couple of really good books um that, that i've you know uh, used recently um and also there's a, a report from the survivors against, survivors against terror in the uk which again you get it just gives you that real insight into people's mindset about how they feel when something happens and they get caught up in it um i also do all kinds of other stuff if you're ever interested newsletters and things and case studies so you can always find me and hopefully we've got some time now for um any questions that anybody's got thank you very much amanda it was really great presentation uh thank you very much uh 50 friends from all over the world joining us uh, today to talk about crisis communications with our amazing expert, Amanda Coleman. Uh, of course, you have the floor for questions or uh, remarks. Before that, I would like to appeal to all of you to become members of the World Communications Forum Association, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, uh, networking communities and, and also knowledge exchange communities in the field of public relations, social media and marketing. You just go to our website, wcfaglobal.com and becoming a member is so easy. And I see here a lot of names who are not our members from Africa, Europe, Asia. So you go to WCFA or you just write World Communications Forum Association and uh and then you will see how to become a member it's a very affordable membership fee and huge tons of knowledge and networking now i am responding to lay and carry that the recording will be available on the website within a couple of days of the world communications forum association so uh lay and carry you will be absolutely happy to hear again and again Amanda's voice and to see the presentation and advices. So I hope that all of you will become members and uh, of, of course of uh, the World Communications Forum Association. But before that, you have the floor 
or questions? Uh, I have a question. <clears throat> yeah, go ahead, sir. And yeah. also raise afterwards. Uh, can I ask? Yes, after the Surya. It's your yeah. turn. Please go ahead. Uh, so, uh, and, you know, there's a, um, a crisis communication during a time of war like in the uh, nomads and, and stuff. And uh, let's just say if there's a country that has, is having the same terror attack, you were talking about it a while ago with a case study. So let's just say if there's a terror attack in a particular country and there's like to, uh, so many journalists around it who are actually covering that. So how is it that we, <clears throat> and um, there's uh, always all these cameramen who are actually uh, shooting all these videos of that particular terror attack. So this thing is going to give an access to you know, that thing is, uh, let's just say if that thing is being broadcasted, uh, whatever is uh, being happening over there. And the ones who are actually doing this, um, uh, uh, doing this terror attack are getting access to it just so that they could actually, um, you know, change their plans, whatever, uh, whatever is being happening in there. Just, they could actually mend or uh, make some changes to their plans so that they are actually successful in um, uh, countering whatever the dangers and, and upcoming dangers. So how is it that we are supposed to maintain uh, communication at that point of time? So there's like, let's just say there's three uh, stakeholders. Um, there's the audience who are actually looking at it uh, and there's journalists and the, the all those um, um, the security groups like the uh, security guards who are uh, over there to neutralize the threat. And the fourth one is the, uh, the government who's supposed to take care of each and every single thing. So how do we um, work on this? Yeah, I mean, that's a, a really um, complicated, complex sort of situation. Um, but from my kind of background experience in the UK, when those sort of things happen, there's um, agreements between um, law enforcement and the media about how they will approach it, what they will do, and almost to give a delay so that there's a kind of reasonable window of time. Now, that's not going to deal with the social media element, but it certainly remove some of the pressure from the media side of it um and i think the key bit is always for me in that is to try and make sure that um whatever you say is accurate that you're not putting people in any kind of danger that's the first point of point um but also that you try and support um the the operational conclusion of of that situation um but it's incredibly there's no easy answer to it, Soraya. It's incredibly complex. Um, I think, you know, the government in those sorts of situations, the government tend to leave law enforcement to try and support, deal with what's happened. They then come in at a slightly later date um, when it's concluded, and then they need to, to kind of be able to, to say what they need to do. But what, it, what it's involved for me in, in my kind of previous experience is lots of negotiation around who's saying what at what time, um, and how you kind of manage that. But in the immediate, and I think they happened in Paris, um, went back in uh, when the attacks happened there, you know, 2016, I think, or something around that time. Um, it's about trying to n not um, make that situation any worse and try and get it to a satisfactory conclusion, make sure people are, are not in any danger. Then I think you come in with with those additional messages um, from certainly from from any kind of government level. So um, I hope that helps. It's not an easy answer to that one. Thank you, Amanda. Grace from Job Work. It's your turn. Your Hi. Hi, Amanda. Hi. Um, yeah, I've been doing this for 20 years. Um, I fell into it. I'm actually a lawyer. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, and I'm very pleased. Thank you so much. You. Uh, I do training for it as well. You, uh, you've reiterated everything that I say, but you've also given me some food for thought, particularly on AI, and I'd love to have a long conversation about that. Um, but these two things I've noticed over the years, and every time I think I've seen a crisis, I get another one that I've never seen before. Um, and that is two things, human nature, ego. I always say, you know, we prepare crisis comms plans, and so the crisis team and management must go between the two, and when you come into the room, the virtual room or whatever, you put your ego in a box, uh, male and female, and it'll be amazing what actually happens because it never happens like that. And the other one is, is and I don't know if around the world you have the same thing, is clashing with the lawyers, particularly lawyers of insurers. So when things fall or break and people are injured, the lawyers for the insurers are the worst because they say, 
you mustn't say sorry. And I say absolute nonsense. You can say sorry without admitting liability because by the time it gets to court, we've had a case for Tiger Brands with listeriosis. Mm -hmm. It's way down the line and you didn't respond. You were inhuman um, and you didn't respond in time. And I've had, unfortunately, many arguments with them because I know the law and I just say, well, (laughs) It's not the law. You took a critical about. position to have an it argument is. with a lawyer. <laughs> it is. So, and of course, for whatever reason, the client seems to, I don't know, take the lawyer more seriously because they pay them more. I don't know. So I don't know if you've had experienced any of that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really good points, though. I mean, on the lawyer thing, I think, yeah, I when I'm doing training, um, to anybody with, who's got in-house legal teams, get to know your legal team, yeah. get to know them, get so they understand things. And it's almost like, I think, you, you, you do, they, do they trust them or, or you know, because they, I don't know. But lawyers go in with case law, don't they, to support them? And this is why I keep saying it's almost like we need to have case studies. We need something that backs up what we're saying, because otherwise it tends to be, you know, lawyer giving you this really kind of reasoned case law argument about why certain things need to happen. And mm. and us saying, well, you know, this is what I think we should do. So it's almost like we've got to have that level of justification, I think, to back up what we're saying in those situations. Um, but definitely it's about really getting to know your legal you know your legal team or the teams that you use within that space so that they so that you can have those discussions and i've had lots of um positive kind of conversations with with legal teams um to try and and get that um to get to that position you make a really interesting point as well about ego um because there was i've been doing some kind of short inter- sort of short interviews with different people with different kind of backgrounds um and in one of them recently um she was saying you know she was talking about you know ego one of the worst things in terms of crisis response is ego crisis leadership is ego and that's where bad decisions get made um and problems occur and i think again it goes back to how people are trained to be in those senior positions, what they learn along the way. Um, and I think, Grace, you picked on a big thing because that's a, a big change. Um, I think with all the reputational focus and everything else that's happening, um, I think, you, you know, trying to find ways to make sure that the ego is left at the door and isn't in that space um, is really critical. Um, so, yes, make some really important, really important points there. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Any other questions? In the meantime, I want to remind you that uh, our next masterclass will have amazing topic. Don't want to overshadow the great topic of Amanda, of course, on crisis management. But the next topic will be artificial intelligence. And uh, all we are thrilled to see how this bloody tool and instrument will develop and will turn our business upside down in a way that very soon all of us will not go to the offices, we'll sit down like that, you know, and and just wait for artificial intelligence to do our job, to write our press releases, to answer our emails, to, to write letters and all those things. So two great experts, Stuart Bruce from University of Leeds, Sura, you know Stuart, maybe? Uh, Mr. Andrew Bruce Smith, is that uh, who you mean? Yes, yeah, Stuart Bruce is a... Yes, is, yes, uh, yes, is, I did talk to him, yes, yes. Is, uh, yeah. a visiting professor in the University of Leeds. And also yes. Aaron Quicken. Aaron Quicken is a great uh, expert from New York. Both of them, they are uh, members of the executive committee of the World Communications Forum Association. Both of them are very very, very knowledgeable experts. So they will talk about artificial intelligence. It will be in one month, sometimes in June, I think, and we will let you know, of course, in a, quite in advance. But in the meantime, do we have additional questions to... Yeah, I was going to say, there's one t- just on the artificial intelligence that Tim's put in the chat, um, which is how do I use it? And I'm, I'm, I'm just playing with it, Tim, if I'm honest mm-hmm. at the minute. So I use it for... Um, crisis simulation development um, because it helps me to kind of look at those images, you know, and things like that that I might need as well as uh, looking at statements. Um, and in terms of incident summary, I haven't used it in in that sort of way for dealing with incidents. It's been more to help with looking at, uh, at statement drafting and um, 
and also looking at uh, sort of challenging it. I tend to try and uh, challenge it to do things. So if there's an, if a situation, uh, there was a situation in the UK just before Christmas to do with the Housing Association and the statement was awful um, that they put out. So I, I put all the details into uh, ChatGPT to see if it would do a better version and it did. Um, and the reason it did a better version, this is my take on why it did a better version, is because it, it said all the right things and it didn't have to go through a committee of people who were tweaking words and taking some of the elements out of it. So, um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm still very much playing with it. I know, sir, I, we had a chat, didn't we, with, um, with, a, with a guy in Australia yes, who yes, ha- was really yeah. expert in um, what it can do and what it potentially is going to do. So I'm sure, I'm sure you'll see more, Tim, come on, on what that can do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we could actually invite him as well, um, um, if you don't mind. I'll just drop him a text about this thing. Okay, so uh, Manda. Really, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, um, I'm absolutely sure that after your presentation, uh, after your lecture, after our meeting, there will be a lot, uh, a lot of new members in the World Communications Forum Association. I think the interest will be much higher. Uh, and uh, we look forward to our next meeting, guys. So last um, call for questions. Yeah, I think it's Victor I... got his hang, hand raised. Victor. Victor. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for sharing all the information. We have a common background. I also was a journalist for 10 years. I switched to the dark side afterwards <laughs> of PR. Uh, so sometimes it is hard to keep the information just for yourself. You, you, you know you can't give it to your former colleagues. You're tempted to do it. You have the journalist instinct. Uh, but that is not my question, just uh, something I was laughing about earlier. Uh, my question is, uh, you were, we were talking a lot about terror attacks and things like this. Mm-hmm. And although they are tragic things for most common organizations or companies, these are not the standard crisis scenarios they, they go through. Could you please tell me, I don't know, in the past one year or two years, maybe, which are the most common scenarios these companies or organizations are preparing for because maybe there is something we didn't see it coming and they are on the wave of learning about new things yeah that's a good point and and like i say i think the although the those sort of things are very rare um some of the principles i think apply across um one of the massive issues i think uh, you know for any organization things that i'm kind of see is cyber attacks in in whatever form um, because so much of our lives are online now, um, it, that's a, a massive um, challenge. Um, and alongside that kind of loss of tech, you know, blackouts um, and loss of power um, and those kind of things. So those uh, definitely is, is a bag of things. I think the other thing that I'm definitely seeing, which is why I, I put it in today, is the reputational side of things. You know, that way the business operates, being under scrutiny, the way um, senior people behave under massive scrutiny. Um, so those, you know, those are my probably two kind of biggest elements that I see. Um, and I think the other, I suppose, the other aspect of that is the um, the climate related aspects. Um, you know, so that's the disasters that will be linked to extreme temperature um, floods and, and lots of things. I think people are starting to recognise, I suppose, the business continuity side of, um, you know, needing to get ahead of crisis as well. So so th- those are, are kind of are the ones that I tend to see a lot of at the moment. Okay, so thank you, thank very, you. very, very much. And more, most probably we, we, we are about to, to finish. I just want to ask something. Yes. Would it be fun if I click a picture with everyone? Doug, go ahead. Thank you. Go ahead. We'll be smiling. Yeah. All right. So smile. So have a great weekend ahead. Uh, Thank you, Amanda, one more time. Respect. Thank you. And I uh, hope to see you very soon, both in the World Communications Forum Association and also uh, during our next uh, master classes. God bless you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. bye.